Sorry. I need to. I need to. Really? Good evening. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Sherry Beaver, and I work at Deaf Victoria as the project lead for this Disability Royal Commission project. Before we commence proceedings this evening, I'd like to do a acknowledgement of country to begin with. So as I said, I'll do the acknowledgement of country. Uh, we're gathering today on the lands of the Wurundjeri people uh, and the Kulin Nation, the custodians of the land, where we are meeting here this evening. Also, I would like to acknowledge the deaf community. We'd like to recognize our elders and our leaders who have advocated for the community on our behalf and our rights and what we have here today. I'd like to introduce the team to you tonight at Expression Australia at the John Michael Lovett Centre. It's quite unusual uh, given we're in the COVID-19 pandemic. We're all socially distanced from each other but one of the great benefits of sign language is that you can still communicate easily with each other when you are socially distanced. Uh, we have people wearing masks as well, which is an interesting time for us uh, in the deaf community. I'd like to thank the Department of Health and Human Services for funding this project. So we thank the Victorian government for that funding so that this project can take place. The objectives of this evening's session uh, to share information with you, the community, from the Disability Royal Commission, the DRC, and how we can learn more about the Disability Royal Commission and how you can make a submission to the Disability Royal Commission in Auslan or in written English and the purposes of the commission and what they're wanting to find out from the Australian community. If you have any questions this evening uh, via Facebook or via Zoom, what we would like to ask is that during the question and answer session, you can send a text message to the Deaf Victoria number on your screen, or you can send a, a question to us via our Facebook page or via our website or the Zoom or this chat function. Now I'll introduce people who are joining me here this evening. I'll just pause for a moment. Are people able to see what's been written on the Facebook page at this point in time. We're just trying to work out our technical requirements so that everyone's able to access information. So just bear with us for one moment. I'm not starting yet, but I just want to make sure and everything has been sorted out on the technology side of everything. But if you have any questions, you can co contact us through the Zoom comments on the Facebook comments or spend it, send an SMS. You can contact any of us. If you're having any technical issues or if you have a question for the question and answer segment, you're welcome to do so. 
But just so you know, we haven't started yet. We'll wait a couple more minutes before we begin this evening. Now, I'll just repeat that for those that might have just joined us. We haven't started yet. We're still just working out some technical issues. Apparently on Facebook, it looks very hard to see the video. So we're working on that now. Those that have joined through Zoom should be able to see me a bit clearer. You know, if you've got a big, beautiful computer monitor, it may be easier to watch rather than on a smartphone or device. But at any time throughout these two hours, if you have a question, you're able to write them through the Zoom chat bar, through the Facebook comment section, or you can send it directly through an SMS phone number. Also, there's a capacity to send messages through video. And, you know, it can be a big or a small question. If you'd prefer to sign your question, you're welcome to send it through, or you can put your hand up and turn on your video if you're open to that and everybody can watch your question as you sign it. Now, I believe my screen is gone, the PowerPoint and everyone can see me. Excuse me one moment. So it's possible we may not be able to have PowerPoints throughout this presentation, but that's okay, it's not a problem. Also to let you know, the slides that I have produced can be made available. They can be downloadable or sent out depending on how Deaf Victoria wants to send them out, but you'll be able to save the information that's kept on the slides from there. If something's important, then I'll maybe I'll alternate between sharing a screen, but I won't leave them up there the whole time. It's important that everybody can see my signing. I will ask Sherry, the project officer from Deaf Victoria, to come back and start the introductions again, just to make sure that everybody can see her signing as clear as possible. She'll come soon. I must say it is a really big room here on this John Michael Lovett room and we're all so spread out following social distancing guidelines, but luckily we can sign across the room to each other. She's on her way. There we go. Hi everyone. I'm back. I'm sorry about the technical hiccups. Okay, hi again. Uh, my name is Sherry Beaver, and I work at Deaf Victoria as the project lead for this exciting project, the Disability Royal Commission project. And we're excited about providing this workshop to the deaf and hard of hearing community this evening. Before I proceed, I would like to do an acknowledgement uh, of country. We're gathered and meeting together on the lands of the Rantry people who and the Kulin Nation have been the custodians. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, uh, and thank them for looking after this land that we can enjoy and live and work on today. We'd also like to provide a acknowledgement to the deaf community. Our work would not be possible without the tireless efforts of our deaf leaders uh, from past, present and emerging and Deaf Victoria was established in the early 1980s. So this organization is 36, nearly 37 years old. And at that time, those Deaf leaders worked very hard to establish 
this association. If it were not for them and other deaf people who have been leaders in our community, advocated for us, who are passionate about the deaf community and our rights, uh, we wouldn't be in this position today. So we also recognise our leaders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to thank uh, Express and Australia for allowing us to have this sent this opportunity to present from the John Michael Lovett Centre. We are socially distanced at 1.5 metres. But again, one of the benefits of Auslan is you can have easily communications with a number of people uh, who are close or far away. We've maintained strict hygiene, you know, as well as wearing masks, I'm just, as I'm sure you have. We're living in unusual times, aren't they? They're referred to as the new normal. For this project, uh, we want to extend our thanks to the Victorian Government, the Department of Health and Human Services, for providing funding for this project for the deaf and hard of hearing community. And the aim of this workshop this evening is to share information with you from the Disability Royal Commission on what it is, what it's all about, and how you can make a submission to the DRC, sharing your experience. We'll share a lot more information with you this evening. So, I have a team working with me here this evening, led by Jim Blythe, who will come on camera soon. We also have Catherine Dunn. Can you turn Catherine's video on, please? Hi, Catherine. Nice to see you. Hi, I wanted to introduce myself. I'm the Individual Advocacy Officer here at DEFIC. Thank you, Catherine. Alex Jones, can I see you? Alex Jones from the DRC, the Disability Royal Commission. Can we have Alex's video camera turned on, please? Someone? Let me see if I can find Alex. Alex, are you able to see me? If so, can you please turn your camera on? No luck? That's fine. We'll see Alex's face later. He's a handsome man. We have to wait. Okay, so move on now to Mark Sandon from Amida, A-M-I-D-A. -A. Mark, are you there? Can you turn your camera on? Hi. Hi, my name's Mark Sandon. And I work in an organisation, A-M-I-D-A. -A, and they support people who have an intellectual disability to help manage when it comes to things about their housing and living. My role with the Disability Royal Commission is to help people submit their experiences, to make submissions, to help the commissioner do their work and to help pr provide reports to the government. Thank you, Mark. Can you turn your camera off now? Got it. We're all good. Now I'll hand over to Jen. Goodbye. Hi. I think it's really important that everybody's patient with the beginning of coronavirus. We know everything's turned to online, digital, virtual working and living and studying and webinars. So it's really important that we try to be as patient as possible. Some of us are newer to using this technology, Deaf Victoria being one of those, being a smaller organisation. So thank you for being patient and thank you for inviting me and having me here to speak tonight. I will be talking about the Disability Royal Commission. But before I get started, I do want to make it very clear that everybody has diverse experiences. We all have different lived experiences. We've experienced different things. Perhaps, you know, two people could have the exact same experiences at one instant. One person may have more access to seeing the police where the other person doesn't. So people may have similar experiences in one aspect, but the outcomes and their other experiences will be different. Some people may have impacts, others might not. 
I do want to acknowledge that some of the things tonight can be quite difficult and confronting to talk about when it comes to the DRC. If you are experiencing any anxiety or ups, you're feeling upset, please contact someone for support. I will put a link on Facebook soon to one of them and you are welcome to contact Deaf Victoria at any time. Blue Knot, I believe, is a Sydney-based support service that you can contact and they are being funded by the DRC. So that's Blue Knot. And we also have Berry, Berry Street here in Victoria that you can contact them as well. And they will provide interpreters just to make sure you have access if you need to discuss anything that may have been triggering or upsetting throughout this process. And it's also important that you do reach into your support networks like your family and friends at any time. Also, as I'm presenting today, I do want to acknowledge that the experiences can be two or three times worse for females and also people from backgrounds such as migrants, refugees, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Their, their experiences can be compounded and much worse compared to those that are not from those groups. I'm just going to have a quick look at my schedule to make sure that I'm staying on track since I've had to take down the PowerPoint. I may make mistakes throughout today, but that's okay. That's normal. At any time you've got any questions or comments, please feel free to contact us. Okay, I think we're about ready to get started. I think we'll begin with showing a photo with those on the Disability Royal Commission. I'll share a picture quickly and then I'll tell you who's on the commission. Okay, so you should be able to see seven people in this photo. The blue star on the shirt, the man who's standing up, that's Alistair McEwen. He's deaf. Next to him, with the blue star sitting down with the crutch over her shoulder, she also has a disability, Professor Rhonda Gallabelli. Oh, excuse me. Gallabelli. Sorry. And then... The, the person in the white suit with the red star, she's an Indigenous woman herself. So you saw that picture I'd just shown with a variety of people. That's to show you their background, who they are. Some have a background in law and in research. Now, with the Disability Royal Commission, some of you may not feel that you identify as being disabled, but Australia follows what's called the Convention of the Rights of People with Disabilities, the CRPD for short. The convention clearly says a disability means those who have an impairment plus a barrier equals a disability. Impairment like deafness, blindness, and so on, Barrier can mean a, lingu a language barrier, not being able to communicate with the wider population. Barriers could mean access to buildings physically. So deaf people, we do have what is called an audio impairment. And that's made worse by the wider community not knowing how to sign. So under the convention, we are acknowledged as having a disability. So Australia must comply with the Convention of the Rights of the People with Disabilities for all their laws, social protection, when it comes to programs such as the NDIS, to make sure that Australia and its government and its services follow in line with the CRPD on an equal footing to make sure that we with a disability are on the same page as those without a disability. Now that aside, the Disability Royal Commission what do they do? They have three aims. 
One is to look at what has happened in the past and how to prevent it continuing into the future. Maybe that could be events or abuses that happen to certain people. For example, deaf people who attended school who were physically punished if they were signing with their friends. That's an example. So we need to look into that and they'll research it and find how they can prevent it happening again. Secondly, it's looking into what can we do if it does happen again. If physical punishment is brought back in against deaf people in a schooling setting, what can be done? You may have, I'm sorry, I just need to look back at my slides to remind myself what the third point was. Okay, there it is. The Disability Royal Commission is to make sure that Australia is equal to everybody, regardless of their disability, without violence and abuse, neglect and exploitation. The aim is to investigate those three points. Next, I'll talk about what violence means, what abuse means, what neglect means and what exploitation means. To be clear, violence and abuse, a lot of people envision extreme forms like physical bashings, rapes and very extreme types of harm. But it can definitely be those things. But there's also other areas. It could be smaller instances which are still included in violence. Abuse can be forcing Abuse can be withholding funds, financial abuse. If people say you can't control your own finances because you're deaf, that is a form of abuse. Or ignoring your right to privacy. I know many people have experienced interpreters breaching their privacy and that is an abuse. That can be disclosed to the DRC. Instead of just telling your peers or tell other people not to book the interpreter, it needs to be told to the DRC that your privacy has been breached. Or if the interpreter speaks to the person that doesn't sign and isn't involving you in that conversation, that is a form of violence and abuse. Maybe if you were younger, you may have been forced to have a cochlear implant when you didn't want it. That is a form of violence and abuse. Violence and abuse isn't only the extreme physical side. There is many different components of abuse. I have a few videos I wanted to share tonight, but I'm not too sure if I'll be able to do so because we've got some technical issues. But I think we might have a go anyway. We'll try to share it. Yeah, okay. I will turn off my video quickly and try to start these other videos. So I was married to a man who was hearing and I'd only known him for six months before we got married. We were married for 23 years and I went, experienced a lot of domestic violence and quite a very difficult time. It was really hard for me to get help from any organisation, whether it was a deaf organisation or a mainstream organisation. And at that time, nobody spoke about violence in the home. Nobody. Right. It wasn't something that was spoken about. I went through it and I tried to escape from home many a times. My ex-husband would emotionally blackmail me into returning and to stay. Okay. I was finally able to leave him after 23 years. And you have four children, is that right? Yes, that's right. Did you look, how did you look after and raise the children throughout that time? 
are they involved with you? Are they stuck with you? Yes, stuck. We were, we were stuck together. Friends and family, were you separated from them? Do you have any supports? Oh, yeah. I was isolated. There was no opportunities to see anyone. No opportunities for friendships. For example, if there was a deaf community event that everybody went to, I probably wasn't there. Most of my family lived far from me. Lived, they lived outside of New South Wales. I didn't have many people to talk to. Those times there was no Facebook or Skype or Zoom or anything. True. And with this man, So you could see in that video there was examples of violence and abuse and there was no accessible information in Auslan about what to do when you experienced that. That's a particular example of violence and abuse which was linked to her deafness. She was married to a hearing person. She was socially isolated from her network. Sorry, everybody, we're still having some technical issues. Okay, great. I'll, I'll move on. I know it's a hard video to look at because we think of other people within our community that have experienced violence like that. I have another video now that shows a different type of abuse. to call in uh, Donald acting cute for the then I checked it, they give me that oh here the way with it where box I was like wow medicate so they put the they do one day I two teachers I never liked I was a principal and my teachers never liked why Dr. Murphy caught me, I was sorry with a friend, my friend that was sorry, I get the truck, 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 truck. If I that still speak very I also I was truck. Another one, I was that's another brief I went to the class, I was talking, talking, talking. One teacher caught me quiet. If you don't be quiet, you'll be hold your tongue under the table. Thank you. That story was about an abuse that happened by a teacher putting the student's tongue under the table for 10 minutes. Now we'll talk about neglect. Neglect is not only leaving someone and not looking after them. Neglect can involve emotional neglect. You can experience that by not feeling involved with your family or friends. Neglect can include physical as well as emotional abuse. People may deliberately hide things from you. Also, it might not be deliberate, but it may be attending events like family events and interpreters aren't being pr provided. It can be intentional, where people aren't provided interpreters as a form of punishment. Often, I've asked organisations or people who my interpreter is and they refuse to tell me the name and I feel like that that is keeping information from me 
And this hasn't been a once off, this has happened countless times. So neglect isn't about your basic necessities to food and water, housing, medication, etc. It can be emotional as well. I do have a video I want to share with you in relation to neglect throughout the educational setting and I'm sure a lot of you won't be surprised. In grade six, I'll never forget my math teacher was talking to the board and she was explaining something about measurements and then she turned around and she said, Carrie, how many millimetres in a centimetre? Obviously, I, I'd missed everything and gone over my head and I couldn't answer. And I said, that was humiliating enough. She yelled at me and told me I had to stay in at lunchtime because I wasn't listening. And when you're a child, if an adult tells you that you're wrong, you accept that, you believe it and you feel that shame. And that, that, that makes me angry. Um, and the other thing is that I remember my peers, the, all the, the children in my class, they would copy the teacher's behaviour. They would copy their condescending attitudes and their patience, impatience with me. And they were just copying it. And because they believed that if the adult didn't value me, then I wasn't worth valuing for themselves either. Um, it affected my sense of self-worth so much. I refused to go to school. I was having a lot of suicidal thoughts um, because I felt, well, if people don't believe that I'm worthy, why should I? Um, so like I said, there wasn't a lot of understanding about how much I was missing. Um, they just had that belief that was my hearing aid, the RS, and my look reading skills, it was enough for me to be on the same level. But that expectation that I should be on the same level as hearing children, it only set me up to fail. Again, as I said earlier, a lot of these videos will be hard to watch and to listen. They may bring back some memories of similar things experienced. It's, it's not easy to watch. Education was neglectful to carry. There's a term called passive neglect where people say, oh, she should be fine, she should do better, instead of providing the access needed as a deaf student. There's a lot of neglect in a medical setting. I remember when I was pregnant, I was due to have a baby soon. I went into the interpreter booking office at the hospital and I said to them, please, I would like the same interpreter for all my appointments. And they said, no, you get who you get. And I said, no, I would like the same interpreter for every antenatal appointment. Because childbirth is a really big deal. It's huge. There's a lot of emotions involved. It's an in-depth program a process. I didn't want different interpreters at different skills showing up every important. It was a very private part of my life. It was medical. I wanted an interpreter that I had a relationship with. So I was able to get the same interpreter. But I had to fight for it. I had to spend so much energy advocating and negotiating for it to happen. Coming up for the time of the birth, I approached the office again and I said, I want the interpreter to arrive when I arrive. Their response was, no, when you start pushing, the interpreter can come. 
And I said, what? What if I'm in hospital for two days? I want the interpreter there. I don't want to be stuck not having communication. And they said, no, you'll get the interpreter when labour starts. The interpreter came when I arrived, but wow, that really was a form of neglect. They neglected my form of communication and didn't value that. This experience isn't alone. I know there's a lot of deaf people that had a, have had similar experiences. It's a systemic problem where this neglect stems from. I'm sure a lot of people have felt this way when they're not given what they need. And now lastly, about when you think about exploitation, it's a hard one. I do have two examples that I'd like to show. I'm sure many deaf people that have attended mainstream schooling have had the same experience. So I'll share this video. I went to a mainstream school, high school, where there was a deaf unit, or in Victoria you call it a deaf facility. There are about 50 deaf students in the deaf facility uh, throughout all the different year levels. I remember growing up, attending the school, and I started under new year, looking forward to my subjects and the periods I was going to be doing, let's say, you know, photography, uh, science, biology, all the standard subjects. I remember choosing biology because I was really keen on it at the time. So I submitted the paperwork, you know, the year before, sent it through, and the time came to start the new year, arrived at school, and I was told, Jason, we need to have a conversation. I said, why? They said, we have a staff shortage. There's no interpreter for you in a biology class. It's better you just join the other four deaf students in one class so one interpreter can attend that class with you. We've got cost pressures. We have to budget. What about my biology? I had to drop biology and instead did carpentry, woodwork. What other deaf students did? I had to fit in with the others. I couldn't do what I wanted to do because there was no interpreter available, an interpreter shortage. I'm sure many of you watching at home went, had the same experience. I did as well. Before I continue with exploitation, I do have a question from somebody watching at home. Can you please turn up your turn on your video? I'm sorry, I can't see the question being signed. Okay, great. Hi, my name's Paula. Can everybody see me? Great. I'm deafblind with Usher's syndrome, and I was wondering which it would be put under abuse or violence. If I attend any class with an interpreter present, with others that are deaf or hearing, when an interpreter says, can you see me? I just wonder why do they single me out? And I'm not the only person with the issue. The interpreter's role is to be suitable to everybody. The interpreter could check in to say, am I standing in the right place? Am I working in the right position? Instead of putting it onto me, I just feel quite offended when interpreters or people within the deaf community say that to me. But anyway, that was my comment. Thank you for your question, Paola. You're asking 
about where to when people say oh can you see me wherever you're sitting near an interpreter and that draws a lot of attention to yourself which may be uncomfortable and that's a good question you can contact the DRC to say that that is a problem you're experiencing there is something I want to clarify um, when I'm giving these different examples of videos of violence of neglect and abuse those watching at home you don't need to label your experience as exactly violence or it falls exactly under abuse you're able to stand up and sign about your experience it doesn't have to be under one category at a time actually Alex would like to respond to that can you turn your camera on please Alex Hi everyone, my name is Alex. I'm sorry about earlier on. I uh, was had my I was I did not turn my camera on. Uh, I work at the Disability Royal Commission, the DRC, and I'm listening to different people's experiences. And all of your experiences are individual. All your experiences, when you feel oppressed by the attitude of someone. Uh, or just being put down, that is a form of abuse and violence. If it demeans you, takes away from your, your self-respect, your dignity, the Disability Royal Commission really wants to hear from you. We're looking at people's attitudes towards people with disabilities, as well as ableism, putting down people who are not able-bodied, or in our case, autism, people who can hear putting down people who cannot hear. So we value your experiences and we want, we want to hear more. Jen's quite right. When you share your experience, you don't need to tell us, I think this is a form of abuse, or I think this would come under your category of exploitation. We're investigating this issue on behalf of the Australian government, and we'll look into all forms of abuse, violence, neglect, and exploitation. Sometimes it can be emotional neglect or physical neglect. It could be emotional abuse. This takes many different forms. Your story is valid. Thank you for sharing it to us. Thank you, Paula. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. And as I said, uh, Paola. Oh, you can turn your video off, thank you. Um, I'll just alert someone to have a look at the chat box. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Paola, for your comment and Alex for your answer to Paola's question. I've had different discussions with different people about the DRC and often they felt like they haven't had any experiences that would be worthy of raising to be investigated. But there are things that are happening or have happened that you may think it's because of your deafness and that is valid and it's important that you let them know. And again, it doesn't matter which category it falls under or if you know or don't know, still submit the information, share your stories and experiences. It's their job to go through it all and prepare it to be provided to the government so they can do better. Now back to exploitation. There's different stories of exploitation. It could happen within a family. Family may say they're going to look after your money because you're unable to do so yourself being deaf and they may spend it instead. They may tell you because you're deaf that you get paid less or they may make you pay for something more because of your deafness. That's a form of exploitation. Deaf people have knowledge and skills and are able to work in a variety of settings, but they may be given lesser work, entry-level positions. It could be interpreters as well that will work privately and 
and may work for two hours and charge at the top of the NDIS cap. That is a form of exploitation. Yes, the money's not coming out of our pocket, but it is a quick way to spend all of your NDIS plan and it's exploitation. Exploitation is not only for work or school, it can happen at home. People have been incarcerated, institutionalised, can happen in medical settings like doctors, hospitals, it can happen anywhere. And you're able to tell the DRC about your experience. Excuse me one second while I check my notes. So until now, the DRC has been gathering a lot of experiences and they've seen a few themes emerging. And they have created what's called an issue paper. And that's really highlighting some qu key questions to consider about certain issues. They haven't finished. This process is still ongoing. The issue paper has also seen there's issues in group homes, education and learning. By group homes, I mean people that live in supported accommodation, perhaps multiple people with different disabilities that have carers staying there. Also, it can be care when it comes to people with an intellectual disability, the legal system, criminal justice system, whether that's interactions with the police, jail, court and parole, emergency planning and response, for example, be having access to information in the city. We know they set up those speakers and those audio systems, but we can't access that. We know that attitude and society is a big problem that we face, that people think we can't do things because we're deaf. Again, another big issue is access to employment. I remember when I was 16, I was excited and I wanted to get my first job. So I went through a newspaper, found the classified section. I circled what jobs I was interested in. I thought, oh, yeah, I can apply for these. So I made a call through the NRS and away I went. I said, hi, I'd like to apply. How can I go about it? There was one job. I think it was a takeaway fish and chip shop or something. I called them and I said, hi. And their response was, we don't want people like you here. And I was shocked. And I'm like, does that mean you don't want deaf people coming into your shop or you don't want them working there? And I was shocked. And I know I'm not alone in experiences like this. Restraints, restraint, restrainive practices. Restrictive practices. Which can be people that are physically restrained from moving, whether it's being bound to chairs or restricting how they can access a community or do things they want to do. Also First Nations people. As I said at the start of the presentation, Indigenous people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders face multiple barriers, especially if they have a disability. Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders with a disability face multiple barriers and have multiple experiences and the DRC recognises that. I'll now like to ask Alex, would you like to add anything? Alex, if it's a yes, please turn on your camera. Okay, I'll take that as a no. We've got a couple of questions that we'll go through, and then I'll go through the process of how you can submit information to the DRC. Kate will now sign her questions. I'll turn off my camera, and then I'll turn my video back on to answer the questions from Kate. Thanks. Hi, everyone. We have two questions. The first question is, the person's asking, I have a son, and he turned eight he experienced some frustration. 
is a young deaf boy that used an interpreter and wasn't happy with this interpreter. My eight-year-old son wants to make a complaint. He had to make a complaint about the interpreter via the interpreter to a particular organization. Is that something that we can submit an experience about to the DRC? Great question. Oh, an eight-year-old child is already wanting to make a complaint about their interpreter. That's great. That's We've got a future advocate in the making. And I know it's difficult making, inter making complaints through interpreters when it may be about them. But yes, definitely, you can tell the DRC about that experience to show that the system isn't set up in a way that deaf people can comfortably complain about the interpreters they have to access. It's a systemic issue. So yes, you most definitely can tell the DRC about your experience and that barrier to communication. It may be quite an extreme or huge issue or it may be minor, but it's still important that you raise it and that they take it into consideration. Now, I think Alex wants to say something about that question. Great. Thank you, Jen, for the opportunity. You're, you're right on the money there. Please do share that, report that to the DRC. The DRC needs to hear about these instances, these different barriers that are put in the place of people who are deaf and people with disabilities. When it comes to making complaints, the complaints process itself has a flaw. There's an area for improvement there. Help the DRC understand that. We want to investigate that so we can improve complaint processes. Everyone has a right to complain. One person asked a question earlier on. How far back can I go when it comes to sharing my experiences with the DRC? The response is, there's no time limit. You can go back as far as you like in time. The Disability Royal Commission was established because for many, many years, people with disabilities have experienced different forms of, of violence, neglect, persecution, exploitation, use, and abuse. There's now an official inquiry which will investigate these experiences and practices. And your experiences of being in school, not being able to attend a particular subject because there was one interpreter for the year and not being able to do what you want to do, that's a perfect example there. It doesn't matter how far back in time you go. What I want to ensure you of is that your experiences over the years need to be heard. They need to be told. We want to understand those so we can change Australian society so it's a better future for all. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thanks. I've seen a few chats pop up that unfortunately some people couldn't see Alex what he was signing. So I'll just reiterate what he said, but I'll let you know that everything is being recorded and it can be rewatched later. So if there was some parts you missed, you can always go back to it. Alex had said that, yes, that's right. The DRC needs to understand the complaint system. So they can tell the DRC to confirm what we're saying. A common question people have asked, do issues need to be recent? But no, you can submit your experience. Perhaps it was a young child 50 years ago. So anything that happened to this year, it's not limited to the last couple of years. It's at any age. It could be any part of your life. And just to add to what Alex has said, it may not be about you. It could be about your husband or wife that's deaf or has a disability, children, your friends, maybe people that you care for. You can disclose and you can make a submission to the DRC at any time. It doesn't just have to be your own experience. For example, I know my mum's experienced a series of things and I will be telling the DRC about it and that's fine. And I believe there's another question from Kate. Yes. Um, I, in terms of going to school and education, 
when you choose my subjects, they were limited. I didn't have full access because interpreters were not available for those subjects. So I had to do subjects where interpreters were available. So in terms of what I wanted, my freedom of choice, what I wanted to do, that was unavailable to me. It's not new today. It's happened many years ago. You need to raise that. What can we do about that today and in the future? Yeah, you might have seen a question. Sorry, my mistake. There was a video I shared earlier about a guy who had to pick subjects based on interpreter availability. That is an issue of neglect. You weren't able to have your own choice and control. And like I said, it doesn't need to have happened recently. It could have happened at any point in your life. Please keep all the questions coming. This is the opportunity for you all to ask a question. Please, at any time, if there's anything you're confused about, please ask us. And I'll just check in with everyone in the room. Is there any questions? Okay. I will keep going. There is another video I'd like to show about exploitation and also neglect. So you can see how they both can happen at the same time. I do see that there is a hand up from Ashton. Can you please turn on your video? Sorry, Jason, Apollos, apologies. Oh, it's from Vanessa. Hi, everyone. Um, I understand all the technical issues. My question is, I speak on my own behalf as an adult. What about deaf children? How can they share their experiences via their parents, the concerns that they have? I look forward to your response because I know that children want to share as well. Thanks, Vanessa. Yes, you can make a submission on behalf of your children. They don't need to make the submission themselves. Even if you're a parent in your 80s and your child's in their 60s, you can still make a submission of what happened as they were growing up. Anytime. I hope that answers your question, Vanessa. If I see a hand raised, I'll, I'll, I'll call your name and then I'll ask you to turn your camera on. Alex. Okay. So. Thank you, Vanessa. Lovely to see you here this evening. Uh, thank you for joining the workshop. Um, I want to encourage every parent here to share the experiences that they have had, their children have had, or your friend has had, as long as you ask for their permission, you need to get someone else's consent. I know many of you that may work in advocacy or support organizations see a lot happen to deaf people. You can share that, but it has to be anonymous, de-identified information. It doesn't have to be personal stories but things that you have witnessed. Alternatively, speak to the person concerned, get their consent, and then share that story with us. So there's no limit. We'll accept all different types of submissions in many different ways and formats. Thank you, Alex. I know often in discussions, we know things that have happened and we don't want to talk about them to respect someone's privacy, but we are able to disclose it to the, D, to the DRC. And it may not just be exploitation from hearing people onto deaf people. It could be deaf abuse against other deaf people, or it could be systemic and in other areas. There's one more video now I'd like to share which is a combination of abuse and neglect. Hi, my name's Mia. And I've got a story in relation to my experience with education. I went to a mainstream school where my school received funding, particular in relation to my deafness. 
the funding was used for an interpreter. But in saying that, the interpreter was not qualified. They were a person that was employed to translate from English into Auslan using signed English for me in the classroom. School would at times take this person to do other jobs in the school. They would take them away to do admin work, which left me alone in the classroom without any access to communication. Once when I was in year 10, there was a sports camp. Now I didn't study sport. There wasn't a subject I did, so I wasn't attending the camp. However, the school took my interpreter and took her for a week to the camp. By doing so, they were able to save money because if they put a teacher on the camp, they would have had to pay for a casual relief teacher to replace the teacher that attended the camp. But by taking my interpreter, they didn't have to pay for a replacement interpreter. But nobody told me that this was happening. It was only when I arrived at school, there wasn't an interpreter present for an entire week. I had no access to the class or education or communication. See, wow. That example showed the neglect. They never told her that they were planning that and the abuse by sending the interpreter on the camp, they saved money. I know there'll be many other examples similar to Mia's. There's been a couple more questions come through anonymously. So I will turn to Kate who will sign those questions for us. Thanks, Kate. Okay. In terms of you know, abuse, violence, neglect, exploitation, if it happens and you think, do you know what, I want to share this with the DRC and submit it, does it have to relate to the police or a legal matter? Do I have to inform the police? Will the DRC inform the police? Will it have legal consequences? That's a great question. Short answer is no. When you submit to the DRC, that can be the end of it. You don't have to report it to the police or follow it up in any other legal avenue. Also, I do want to let you know the DRC have funded a separate body called the legal... I have the correct information on my slide. Excuse me one second, I'll get it up. Disability Legal Support. It's available and it's free. You can contact them to just to find out what your legal rights are or your standings when you tell the DRC. But also remember, it's a completely confidential process. You can submit your story and your experience. And if they want to share it publicly, they have to ask your permission and you can say no. You don't have to make your information or your story shared publicly. We don't want anyone to have any fear of retribution or further consequences. And if you feel that way, you can let them know and they'll ensure that your safety is, is upheld. Okay, another question. My son is deaf and he wants to be involved in a particular sports club. The sports club were willing to accommodate his needs and provide access to him? No. They just left him out. They neglected him. Is that a form of abuse? Yes, that is neglect because your your son has the right to be involved in sports, to participate in activities he enjoys. So I would say that is neglect. I did see Vanessa had her hand up again. Can you please turn your video on? Hi there. I was just thinking, I have another question for you, Jen. I'm really pleased that you can put submissions in Auslan. If I submit, who will interpret it? Will I know which interpreter? Um, can I see the Auslan to English interpretation and approve it or sign it off before it's received by the DRC? Yes. So, so yes, I will be talking about the submission process in a minute. 
And I, actually, I think I might hand this over to Alex to respond because he's more experienced in this area. But yes, you can definitely submit in Auslan and it will be interpreted. But I'll get Alex to expand on that answer. So please, Alex, if you can pop your camera on. Yes, thank you. Great question, Vanessa. Um, it's critical that deaf people have the right to know who it is that will interpret their submission to ensure that they're comfortable um, with that interpreter providing that service. So we will reach out to you and check. We'll ask for your preferences as well. Of course, uh, we will be engaging professionally certified interpreters if we have a interpretation, we'll have it interpreted into English and then you can read the transcript or the interpretation. We'll accommodate all of your requests and preferences. I do want to raise a point, however, about submissions to the DRC. You can say that I'm submitting this to the DRC and I want this to be de-identified or anonymous or I want my story uh, shared without my name, de-identified, or I want my name identified with the story, with the submission. So there's different ways that the DRC can acknowledge and receive your stories. There's a whole range of different ways. Some people want their name to their story. Others don't want their name to their story. It's up to you. We just want to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Wonderful. It's really great to have someone here with us here tonight that works for the DRC that can answer all these questions on the spot. I think I'll move along now to go through the process of how to make a submission. I see, I do see the question about accessibility and if I could just put you on hold if you don't mind and we'll come back to it. Okay, excuse me, I'm just looking at my notes. So you can make a submission through a variety of ways. You can handwrite your submission or type it and print it and post it. There's an address which I will make sure Deaf Victoria can publish on their social medias and website afterwards. So you can have a you can submit via written form, print form, and send it, or you can email it directly to the DRC. You can also make a submission over the phone via the NRS, through speech or through sign, VRS. You can also submit in Auslan. You don't have to only submit in English. You can film yourself signing your experiences and they will organize it to be translated. And interpreted you don't need to worry about that they will send an acknowledgement to say that they received your submission and it'll go from there so there's auslan english online email video phone also there is two other options to submit there are public hearings which members of the public can attend there is a specific process You'll inform them that you want to attend and they'll send you a summons in the mail. And that means you have legal permission that you have this, the, the safeguards are in place to protect you when you go. There can be private submissions. That means there can be one of the seven commissioners. You can choose who you're most comfortable with, whether it's someone with or without a disability, someone's deaf or Indigenous, or you may want to have someone that isn't from the same background or identity as you. The commissioners will organise to meet with you. However, a lot of this was before coronavirus. It would happen face to face. I'm not sure about it now. I'm hoping Alex can clarify, but I believe it would be digital meeting. So through that, you can do it in Auslan and just talk about it then leave 
or if you'd prefer more of an interview style process where they ask questions and you respond is another alternative way to make your submission. So there's many options available of how you can do it. I might just check in with Alex to see if there's anything you wanted to add about public and private hearings. If it's all turned to digital due to coronavirus. Good question. Thank you. Uh, the we have had open hearings, public hearings in the past, when anyone could attend. And recently, we had a public hearing in Homebush in Western Sydney. And people did come and they found it very interesting. At the same time, it was also live streamed and that can be accessed via the DRC's website. You see an interpreter there, as well as live captioning. You're quite right, Jen, with coronavirus, the DRC has made an announcement and we have a new schedule of hearings going forward until the end of the year. The current plan is that they all will be live streamed only. So they're not open to the public per se because of the risk to the public of spreading and catching coronavirus. Uh, academics, professionals uh, who put forward statements in the hearing uh, will be connected via Zoom. So you'll see a lot of people, just like tonight here. It's a Zoom event. It's accessible to all that have the technology. And there are some technical issues that we also experience at the commission in the hearings. Uh, in August, it'll be our first online live streaming only hearing. And that hearing will focus upon COVID-19 and the impact upon people with disabilities, including deaf people, with regard to communication. So the focus will be COVID-19 in August. But going forward, we'll have other hearings throughout the year on a range of topics and issues. So hearings aside, from this point on, they only will be live streamed. They'll be fully accessible to people who are deaf and hard of hearing via Auslan and live captioning. Briefing sessions. Jen's a oh, private, private hearing. Okay. Um, Jen said earlier on, a um, person uh, may want to meet one on one. Uh, you can request that you want to have a private session with whom one of the commissioners. You can have a one on one with them. A private setting. If you are deaf and communicate in Auslan, we'll organise an Auslan interpreter to be available for that private session with a commissioner, one-on-one. -on -one. I hope that answers those questions. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Alex. That was perfect. Yes. So, and also, before we move on to the questions, there was something I wanted to clear up. Deaf Victoria can support you in your submission process at any time. You can contact Kate, Caitlin, or Sherry, the project officer, and Maxine, who's the general manager of Deaf Victoria. You can contact them for support here in Victoria, or you can ask your friends and family, but Deaf Victoria are here to help with your submission process. Now, those watching who may not live in Victoria, we have Mark Sandon. Lisa Martin. Sort of. And um, I think some people haven't been able to see his video earlier, but I'll ask him if he can turn on his video and let, let us know what he can do. Sorry, sorry, Kelly. Hi, everyone. If you missed my introduction earlier on, uh, I work for an organisation called AMIDA, and that organisation supports people who have an intellectual disability, to find housing and accommodation. But I am, we are supporting the Disability Royal Commission uh, via AMIDA, and I am able to support anyone who wants to approach us to 
share a submission with the DRC. A deaf person in another state is welcome to contact me. You can sign your uh, experience to me and I'm happy to share that via English or in Auslan with you and thank you. Great, thanks Mark. Glad everybody could see your face now. Okay, um, Paola has a question about accessibility. Would you like to sign your question? If you can, if you do, please turn on your camera. I'll turn off my camera now. I can take this, Kelly. Okay. Hi, everyone. It's Paolo again. Um, what I want to say is, if you go to an organization, training session or course, or even a social event, and you're asked, what are your accessibility needs? Maybe an OSAN interpreter, a live captioning, Zoom. But what if the, you're told you, we cannot provide both to you, you can have one or the other? Are we asking too much? How do I know if I'm asking too much to have two forms of access to meet my needs? Can I only have one? That also made me realize, maybe I am asking too much to have an Auslan interpreter and captioning, but I need both. My eyesight, okay, I can only see out of my left eye. I have tunnel vision. So I, my eye becomes very weary and I need breaks from time to time. Therefore, I rely upon reading captions. So I don't know the answer to that question. Does someone? Thanks, Paola. Good question. When we ask for accessibility, there's no such thing as too much. We have the right to whatever accessibility requirement we need to be on the equal footing as everybody else. You may remember that I mentioned earlier the Convention of the Rights of the People with Disabilities, the CRPD. That is the interpretation of the human rights, which the whole world is to follow. The CRPD clearly says that people with disabilities are entitled to access information at the same level as everybody else. And that means interpreting and captions, whatever makes it accessible for us. There's no such thing as too much. We can ask for these accommodations and when they're not provided, we can tell the, C the DRC about them. And sorry, um, back to the Royal Commission. Victoria had a Royal Commission into family violence a couple of years ago. There was a lot of investigations done just here in the Victorian context about family violence, how to prevent it, how to protect people and what changes needed to be made. There was 227, sorry, 227 or 277, I think it was 227, different recommendations provided after that Royal Commission. However, one of the challenges is that the government doesn't have to follow recommendations from a Royal Commission. They can decide to whether they take them on board or not. One thing that comes out of the recommendations is that though the government can see it and make decisions of how they do follow it up and consider it. After that Royal Commission into to domestic violence, there was an organisation established called Orange Door and now families in Victoria can contact Orange Door for support services if there's any experiences of violence that may need counselling, couples counselling, children that have been exposed to violence, how to protect children from domestic violence. So that's just an example of how Royal Commission was used and what had come out of those recommendations. We had a, a Royal Commission into the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And we know that a lot of those recommendations weren't followed. And that is a reality that could happen with this commission. 
However, it's worthwhile giving your stories. The more stories that you provide, the more knowledge that they have of the diverse experiences of the deaf and hard of hearing communities and more likely that things will lead to a change. I'm going to have a quick look at my agenda just to make sure there's nothing that I've missed. Okay, now we've got some time for question and answers. I hope we've got some questions from those watching at home. If there's not many questions, then maybe I'll invite Alex to add, Mark to add anything, perhaps anyone from the, from the Deaf Victoria team may wanna add something. And I do wanna repeat what I said earlier. If you are feeling upset or triggered if something here has affected you in any way, you can contact Blue Knot, that's Blue K N O T, or you can contact Drum. Drummond Street, and they will provide Auslan interpreters for any support if you require it. Deaf Victoria will put a link to these services on their Facebook page so you can get any support if you need after today's seminar. Okay, over to you, Alex. Great. Thanks, Jen. That was brilliant. Please hold the Disability Royal Commission accountable. And we also need to hold the Australian Government accountable. The Disability Royal Commission has a terms of reference. We really want to ensure that violence, abuse, neglect, and exploitation are removed from Australian society for all people with disabilities in all different places. The private home, hospital, legal system, police, schools, education settings, and so on. We want to remove that. How can we do that? It's through you sharing your stories with us, your experiences, helping us identify those issues where we can then put forward recommendations to government. Sorry, everyone, the lights just went out. See what happens? Technology, even the lights. Anyway, so where was I? We're going to put forward recommendations to help improve Australian society, to make Australia a more inclusive nation People with disabilities are gaining access, are gaining um, rises in equality, but we don't have full equality. We don't have full inclusion. We don't have the same rights as people without disabilities. And why should we have to be second-class citizens, disempowered and put down? That's why it's so important to hear from you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Alex. So, many times, deaf people often feel that they're unable to achieve things that people that aren't deaf are, that they're left behind and they're left out. I encourage you to submit stories to the DRC so changes can be made. There's another anonymous question that's come through. I'll ask Kate to sign the question. But before we start, we're talking about violence, abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Maybe your experience doesn't fit neatly under one heading. It could be in relation to your deafness, being hard of hearing, or deaf blindness. So please, Kate, can you sign that question? Yeah, I want to make a submission about something that happened with an, about an interpreter. Once I submit it about that interpreter, will they investigate that interpreter? Will that interpreter know that I made a, a you know, complaint sharing my experience with them? How will my privacy be protected? How will my rights be protected so it doesn't come back to me? Excellent question. For example, 
if there is an issue with the specific interpreter that you disclose to the DRC, they won't investigate that particular interpreter that you've named. By investigate, maybe I'm using the wrong sign here. Investigate, that means they're gathering evidence, collecting stories. They're wanting to know what the issue is, what the problem is and how it can be fixed or prevented. They don't want to know that A to Z of your full life story. You can comfortably, confidentially talk about an experience you have with an interpreter. You could de-identify them. You don't need to use their name if you are that concerned and you want to protect yourself. It is a confidential process. It's not going to get out there in the community. Nobody else is going to hear about it. However, if you do talk about it at a public open hearing, that is publicly accessible. So others will hear your story. I believe there's another question coming in and it's gonna come from Kate. So we'll just switch to her. Um, just going back to Alex. The question to Alex is, will the person who's deaf blind uh, go to the DRC and provide me with the particular supports that I need. For example, I have particular access requirements. I may need a deafblind interpreter. I may want a preferred interpreter that understands me and knows me well. Can I make that request to the DRC and will they provide the support to me that I need as a deafblind person? Alex, can you please respond? Thank you for the question. If you want a private hearing or session with one of the DRC commissioners, you can say, I'm deaf blind and I require a deaf blind interpreter. This is my preference. The DRC will consult with you and work with you or with uh, any other preference that a deaf or deaf blind person will have and who you want to work with to share your experience with us. If you want to write a submission and send a submission, we want to support you to ensure that your story is told and we can receive that. I just want to add one other thing as well. For private sessions, you can do those via video conferencing with a commissioner one-on-one. -on -one. And if you're deaf blind, we will ensure that you have the appropriate supports to be able to do that. In this case, a deaf blind interpreter. Thanks, Jen. Thank you, Alex. Is there any other questions? Not at this stage. Anybody watching at home, anyone on Zoom? Is there any further questions? No. Looks like we've been a great team here. We've given you all the information you need and there's no more questions. Fantastic. But we haven't yet finished, no. We do aim to finish at eight o'clock. If it is quiet, we may slow it down, but no, we do have another question. I will go to Kate. Next question is, okay, you've got the DA, DDA and the CRPD. Will that be considered by the DRC in their investigations? Oh, sorry. Yes, Alex, do you want to go ahead? Sure, you can answer that. Great question. Wow. That is another important question we need to consider. The DRC will consider a broad range of uh, legal policy questions, including the International CRPD, the Disability Discrimination Act, and maybe other national pieces of legislation. We will be investigating and comparing all these different treaties, conventions, pieces of legislation to put forward 
a set of recommendations? So that's a great question. Yes, we'll be considering all different types of legal instruments from around the world, including Australia. And how we can ensure and improve Australian society for all. A positive change for everyone. Thank you, Alex. You answered that question much better than what I could have. We've got another question here from Philip. Would you like to turn your camera on? Yeah. Oh. Hi, everyone. Uh, I have a question. Um, I know you can put forward a submission about a particular issue like, you know, my mother, about my children, my partner, myself. But what I'm wondering is, can I put forward a submission you know, about general um, general issues, not about one person or a group of people, but about, you know, deaf people, broadly speaking, from a community perspective. I grew up and I've seen a lot uh, with friends I went to school with. A lot of deaf people have suffered in different ways just because they're deaf. And that makes me want to share something about the collective deaf experiences that I've seen growing up with other deaf people. Is that possible? Great question, Philip. I believe you can, because we're also looking at systemic impacts and how we're all affected. It could be in relation to, oh, I can't even think of a good example. When we talk about systemic issues, it could be the legal system something we've seen once off or it could be something we've seen repeatedly. Could be something that may not have just happened to you. You may have observed it happening to the deaf community as a whole. I can see someone's typed a question. When is the cutoff time for making a submission to the DRC? I knew that they had planned to submit their final recommendations in April 2022, so it's 2022. But I'm not sure when the final submission cutoff date is. Perhaps Alex, you could answer that one for me. Thanks, Jen, for the question. You're quite right. We had initially envisaged final report being due to the Australian government in April 2022. We will be communicating that closing date but we want to ensure that there's enough time to be able to consider all of the submissions received. So there will be announcements throughout time and we will be informing the Australian community of a closing date, just like previous Royal Commissions have done. Just in response to Philip's uh, question, your life experiences, sharing your life journey with us, what you've seen along the way, what's happened to deaf people, that will provide a wonderful narrative, you know, a, the big picture of what it's like for many deaf people that you've lived with and experienced yourself. So please share um, viewpoints that you have collected throughout your life experience, seeing what has happened to other deaf people. Okay, I see a question's come up here from Caitlin. So Kathy. Yeah. Can you all see me? Yes, we can. Okay, I hope that's clear. Okay, feels strange here. Okay, so I remember going to a police station once and I saw this notice about they provide interpreters. I thought, oh, great. So I asked the police officer behind the counter, um, hi, I'm deaf, could you please organize an interpreter for me? Um, they said, you need to talk to me first. Can you lip read me? And I thought, well, why are you asking me this question? I've asked you, you know, can I have an Aussie interpreter present? Can I share that type of experience with the DRC? Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, I'll just wait for you to turn off your video. Okay. Great, still on. Thank you. Yes, that is still part of what you can submit to the DRC. Your experience with the police requesting an interpreter and then forcing you to lip read instead. That's not fair. I'm, I'm not sure why you were there at the police station. It's none of my business, but that is an issue and it can be an ongoing problem. It's definitely something that should be submitted. There's another question. I'll ask Kate to sign. Okay. Question is, 
at a particular incident that happened to a person. The person's maybe traumatized by an experience or just have a clear recollection of it. Can they still submit something? Do you have to remember every detail from start to finish, the who, the what, the when? Does it have to be 100% clear or can you just share what you remember? That is a fantastic question. No, you don't need to remember every single detail. You can tell them whatever you do recall. The DRC do have some questions which can prompt you to help you think about your experience. I'll quickly bring up my slides so you, you can see what the questions are. So there are five important questions that you can think of to help you when you're telling your story. One is what happened, when, where, doesn't need to be precise dates. It could be at a particular time. You may not remember who, but you could remember what they did and when roughly. Secondly, they'll ask if you reported the incident or not. If you didn't, that's fine. You can still make the submission. You don't have to have reported it to the police or anybody else. It can be something that had happened to you and you didn't follow it up, but it can still be submitted to the DRC. So it's what's happened. Have you disclosed? And yes, if you did disclose or report it to someone else, they'll be interested in knowing who and when and what the outcome was of that. If something was to happen to me, and I decided to report it to the police and I attended the police station, it will be important to tell the DRC whether they provided an interpreter because that can also lead on to further instances of abuse, violence and neglect. They'll also ask you what you think would like to be changed. You know, you've experienced it. You may have ideas that how this could be avoided occurring again in the future. You can also tell the DRC about ideas. If something's happened to you, you can put forward suggestions of how to avoid it happening again. They may include it in their recommendations if they agree. There's also opportunity for other information. You don't need to write a novel. It doesn't need to be a long video, just a submission of your experiences. Alex. Great, you're right on there. Uh, all good, valid questions. But deaf people often like to be asked a question and be able to respond to it. If you feel that you don't feel confident to be able to just stand up and tell your story, um, you can have a, a trusted friend that you uh, want you know, to ask you those questions so you can respond to them in that conversation style. That's also a submission too. It doesn't have, there's no right or, right, right or wrong way to present your submission. It's your way. The deaf way is welcome. Thank you, Alex. I do want to ask you the quick question. Is there limitations to the length of the video or the size? Because I remember seeing it somewhere, but I've forgotten if that was for the DRC or somewhere else. Is there any limits to the size of videos or the time length of submissions? There's no limit per se, uh, but uploading from what I can remember on our website can, I think be up to 10 files all up, up to four gigabytes. So that's a reasonably large size file. Um, a lot of information there. But if you have technical issues, the DRC is there to assist to ensure that we can receive your video submissions. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. We've got another question. We are running, we're heading towards the end of the session. But 
I want to be clear, you, there are still times after tonight's session. If you have any questions, you can contact Deaf Victoria and any member of the team can help answer that. So you can submit your questions via email or by video. This isn't the end of your opportunity to ask questions. There'll be further opportunities to ask Deaf Victoria. Now I'll head over to Kate. Thanks, Jen. Uh, this is not a question that someone's asking me. I'm asking this question myself. Um, Deaf Victoria Advocacy Service, how can we relate and support the DRC? Deaf Victoria has an individual advocacy service. So if you have any issues yourself in your everyday life that you need support for, you can contact us for individual advocacy service. And that officer is me. So I'm happy to support you. If you decide you want to make a submission, I can support you by doing that. As Alex said earlier on, he already mentioned that if uh, you want to put a submission in, it doesn't have to be in one way. You know, it's not one size fits all. It can be via Auslan, it can be written, any other way. We can support you through that process of making a submission. You may want us to assist you write it so you can sign it to us and we'll transcribe it into English. We'll provide different supports to you. I know there's a lot of concerns right now about coronavirus in our community. The advocacy service takes that on board and we've made arrangements so that we can still meet your needs. If you do want to make a submission to the DRC, we can provide that support to you physically, 1.5 meters away, uh, following responsible social distancing. If you have any concerns, know that we are here for you. We'll provide any support we can in a variety of ways to ensure that your voice will be heard. We're here to help you to ensure that your voice is heard. Thanks. Back to you, Jen. Thank you, Kate. Now, we've got about 14 minutes left. While we wait for anybody with any last burning question, I do want to let you all know that we will be sending out a survey from Deaf Victoria shortly. I'll ask you, Maxine, if you could sign it to me and I'll tell everybody. It'll be available on Facebook. And the questionnaire will be, it'll ask you if you learned anything from tonight. Was there any new information? Has this session helped or has it made it more confusing? Do you feel confident that you understand the DRC and feel confident to make a submission? Yes or no? And we'll also ask for any general feedback and any ideas for future workshops and webinars. To be clear, the survey will be 100% anonymous. If you think tonight was awful, please tell us. It's really important to get the feedback from you in the community, your honest feedback from those that are deaf and hard of hearing. So Deaf Victoria can provide the right information for your supports and your needs. So it'll be anonymous. And that means I won't know who's giving the feedback. Just checking in around the room here, if there's any more questions. Oh, Alex has popped up on screen. Yeah, I think that this Royal Commission is a once in a lifetime opportunity for people who are deaf. Share your stories with us, don't hold back. We know that we can improve so much more for the future of, of deaf children today. When you think about the abuse and the violence, the exploitation, the neglect, we've experienced that. But how can we look back and change that so it doesn't happen in the future, for the, so that future generations of deaf people have a better life experience. What do you want for the deaf community of the future? And how can we change that? We need your input. We need you to share your visions with us for a better Australia, for deaf people. We need to understand what that looks like, what we have, what's missing, and importantly, how we can improve. That's all I wanted to say. That's why we're doing this. Thanks, Jen. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, I've worked myself many years as an advocate in different organisations. I also worked in Deaf Victoria myself. And one thing that I find particularly 
amazing is working with deaf people who I've supported, many people say that they've, ha they've had something happen to them and they don't want it to happen to any other deaf person. And that is something that the Disability Royal Commission is aiming to change from a top-down approach. Okay, I know Phillips, keen to ask another question. Yeah, um, the, like I'm thinking about the April 22 cutoff. So Deaf Victoria, uh, what do you plan uh, as your key focus areas, hearings for the Disability Royal Commission? Because I know there have been different focuses upon education, medical health, Indigenous. Uh, they're all well and good, but what about a national focus upon deaf people and people who are hard of hearing or hearing impairment issues? I'm hoping that the DRC would take that on, having a focus area. And I'm thinking, uh, will this be a one-off event or will it be a regular six-monthly event? Will there be themes, for example, deaf education could be one workshop theme where you could um, share information and providing uh, in supports, uh, a whole range of different areas about deaf life. Sorry to dump all those questions on you, Jen. I hope you got them. No, thank you. And you always ask the hard questions, Phil. No, it's great. Really good question about the deaf specific audiences and hearings. I can't answer that, but Alex can. And in regards to Deaf Victoria's plans, Maxine can respond to that better. So I'll head over to you, Maxine, if you can put your camera on, please. Okay, can you see me? I'm on a computer can see down there that my name is Maxine. If I haven't yet met you, I'm not Catherine Dunn, even though I'm her computer. I'm the new general manager for Deaf Victoria, just gone three months, staying on a little longer, but we actually are looking to recruit a permanent general manager in this position. But thank you, Philip, for your question this evening. Uh, Deaf Victoria is doing a lot of work behind the scenes to support the commission. This event is happening this evening because we're working in close cooperation with the Department of Health and Human Services, DHHS. They're funding this piece of work and we have annual funding for our advocacy work, both individual, providing support for individuals and individual issues. We also are receiving funding for a range of different projects. So this opportunity here is one of the projects we receive funding for because of its importance to get the word out to the deaf and hard of hearing community so they can share their experiences to the commission. So that's why this funding has happened uh, because we are working with DHHS and we wanna provide specific information supports to deaf people. Uh, another project that's happening at the moment relates to health. I just wanna talk about that. This health project is looking into uh, hospitals and health settings generally and how they can better provide support and access to people with deaf and hard of hearing, rather than deaf people arriving, having to explain the same story again and again. I'm deaf, I need this, this, and this. This is tiring for deaf people. We don't want to be an afterthought. We want to find best practice and planning. So when a deaf person arrives in a health setting, um, the health setting knows what they need. It's business as usual. They can make it happen. It doesn't have to be an addition, an afterthought, an extra. So working with many different organizations, including Expression Australia and other health organisations, including hospitals. And we hope that this will be a successful project. It's one example of um, some of the project work we're doing uh, because the DHHS are funding these specific discrete projects. So once this Disability Royal Commission project is done, then we're promoting other projects we're doing, including health, to support the community. But we want deaf Victorians to know uh, that there will be an ed the education review that's taking place this year. There was an education review in 2015. Uh, there'll be another one happening in 2020. And Deaf Victoria is already starting to ask the question uh, about the education review and how we can provide feedback and share their experiences, provide those submissions. So we are advocating with the Department of Education so that deaf people can present their experiences and submissions in Auslan or written English as they pertain to education, their education. What's happening, generally speaking, throughout government and reviews and inquiries 
and Royal Commissions, what's happening out there, we aim uh, to make sure that deaf people get a seat at the table and deaf people's voices are heard. They need to know what deaf Victorians need. If anyone in the community has any ideas or you see something happening, you think, do you know what deaf Victoria or deaf people should be considered or consulted, please contact us. We'd appreciate your help so we can advocate for deaf and hard of hearing Victorians. Hope I've answered your question. Yes, thank you, Maxine. I know we are heading towards the end of our session tonight. I wanted to answer two questions that were submitted anonymously. Now, in regards to this being for Victoria only, yes, Deaf Victoria does work to support deaf and hard of hearing Victorians. However, the DRC is available for everybody to watch. And that's why we've made this live stream available for everybody across Australia. This information isn't only relevant for Deaf Victorians. There is also Deaf Australia, which maybe you may be able to contact to support, to ask for support. Mark Sandon, who was up on screen earlier, is available to support you throughout the submission process as well. Mark is able to support you regardless of whether you live in Victoria or not. Now, our last question before we finally wrap up is if the, the process finishes the DRC and nothing comes of it, what do we do? While there is nothing stopping you from advocating yourself or the deaf community coming together as a whole to advocate over particular issues. I know there are common themes that deaf community face barriers to communication and that flows on to education and employment. Interpreting is another issue within the deaf community. We often have problems with the interpreters that work with us. And that is something that we can raise and make a submission about with the DRC. And they can make recommendations towards your government about how the complaint system for interpreters work. Now, I think that's all for now. But actually, I do want to ask Alex if you can jump in quickly about any deaf specific public hearings. Good question. Thank you. Uh, two responses. The Disability Royal Commission really is ambitious and wants to work with a whole range of organisations. If Deaf Victoria wants to work with the DRC, we want to work with you. And I know that Deaf Victoria are working with the Royal Commission. And in terms of specific deaf hearings, uh, I can't provide that response to you right now, but definitely we are considering having to take this request on notice. It may be an area that we need to focus on. We will maybe organize specific forums or opportunities for people to come together, but I will take that on board on notice and share that within the commission. The DRC has a lot of flexibility depending on what's happening, what's needed, we can respond to that we're agile in that sense. So thank you for your input, Philip. That's it. Thank you. Okay, we've got three more minutes left. I know everyone's keen to wrap up. I would like to say thank you to Deaf Victoria for asking me to present tonight. I feel quite honoured and privileged to be here to present to all of you watching. I appreciate all of your questions that you've sent through and that you've asked, and it's helped us all learn a lot. I would like to ask Kate, Sherry and Maxine, is there any final comments or questions before we close for the night? No, okay. I'd like to say thank you to the captioner and the two interpreters, Kelly and Paul, Thank you to Sherry, Maxine and Kate for everything they've done in the background and the lead up to today. Thank you to Alex and Mark and also Nicole Clark, who's an interpreter based in Sydney, who's been a part of this big team putting all this work together. I'd like to say teamwork makes a dream work. So thank you all. Thanks for all your work on this to make it happen tonight like to say thank you to the Department of Health and Human Services, DHHS, for the government support. Thank you to Expression Australia for allowing us to use the JMLC, the John Michael Lovett Centre, 
we've been able to work comfortably here while adhering to the social distancing guidelines. And thank you all at home for being so patient with all the technological issues we've been having. And it's really made the night go smooth for us. So thank you all. Have a really lovely evening. Good luck with your submissions. Please do it. I'll be making mine. Okay. Thank you. Please put your cameras on now to say a final goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Good job, team. Yes. Okay. We'll shut it off now. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Hmm.